presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character originally created in the motion picture The Third Man with zither music by Anton Karras. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man. Yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. Harry Lyme had many lives. And I can recount all of them. How do I know? It's very simple. Because my name is Harry Lyme. Don't get me wrong, I love Budapest. From Budapest come goulashes and shardashes. Shardashes being something you dance and goulash being something you eat if you go for all that paprika. Me, I love it. So, when I got that telegram, I took the first train to Hungary. Maybe I'd better tell you about the telegram first. Dear Mr. Lyme, it said, my bank is going to be robbed and I need your help. It was signed Fekete, evidently a man's name, nobody I knew. I knew all about bank robberies, however, and I was dying to help. Besides, as I say, I love paprika. So I started packing right away. Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, Too Many Crooks. Before calling at the bank, I stopped at a cute little flower shop I happened to notice across the way. Uh, good morning. Uh, would you give me something for my buttonhole? Well, Lily. Lily, what are you doing here? We have some very pretty pink gardenias. Oh, come on, Lily, don't tell me you don't remember me. And how are all the Corellis? The huh? who? Now, give me that, Lily. My name is Lulu. Well, it used to be Lily, and you used to be a blonde, and the Corellis, as you know perfectly well, because you used to work for them, are the best bank robbers in Central Europe. Well, what about it, honey? Here are your gardenias, Harry. Now, get out of here. Okay, honey, okay. No need to get in a hassle. I'm telling you, Harry, get out. I never was one to argue, so I took my gardenias across the street and walked the bank. Mr. Fekety will see Mr. Harry Lyme. You can go in now, Mr. Lyme. Oh, thank you. Mr. Fekety will see you. Yes, that's what I gathered. Uh, this way, please. And thank you. Oh, Mr. Lyme, yes. will you please extinguish your cigarette? Mr. Fekety does not approve of smoking. Thanks. I'll bear that in mind. Mr. Lyme. Come in. Come in and shut the door. There's a date. Do you mind if I sit down, Mr. Fekety, or is there a rule against that? Sit down. Sit down. You're a very impertinent young man, but I don't mind that. I am an impertinent older man. We ought to get along together very nicely. What's your proposition, Mr. Fekety? Yeah. What do you mean? That's what I said. What's your proposition? Hey, listen to me, Lyme. I don't make propositions. I consider them. Have it your own way, Fekety. I'm a big boy now, and I'm not so easily impressed. Uh, what do you mean, impressed? All this big desk, double secretary, Mr. Fekety, will see you now. Mr. Fekety doesn't approve of smoking, busy executive hoopla. may go down very well with the bumpkins who give you their money to invest. It doesn't mean a thing to me. You sent for me, didn't you? I crossed three national borders to get here and lost a lot of time, so don't ask me what's my proposition. <laughs> what's yours, Mr. Fekety? <laughs> very good, very good indeed. You're just the man I hoped you were. <laughs> Have a cigar. Wouldn't that be breaking the rules? I make the rules, Mr. Lyme, and I don't like cheap tobacco smoke. Nor do I enjoy being forced to distribute these very costly custom-made of annals to every, what is it you call them, bumpkin, who comes into my office. I think you'll enjoy these. Thanks. Light? Thanks. Good. Now that we're a little more at ease, uh, suppose you tell me something about yourself. Why? What do you mean, why? I wish you'd stop asking me what I mean by everything I say, Fekety. I said why, and I meant why. 
You put private detectives on my trail, you found me, you made me a very substantial down payment on services to be rendered, and now, when I get here, you want me to tell you about myself. That's just plain silly, old man. It's obvious that if you went to all that trouble and expense to get me here, you knew about me already. I'm the one to ask the questions, <laughs> not you. <laughs> better and better. Mr. Lyme, if you were just a little less notorious as a cook, I'd offer you a vice presidency in my bank. I forgive the insult, Mr. Fegarty. Uh, what do you mean, insult? There you go asking me what I mean again. I meant insult. Now, don't you get pompous on me, Lyme. You are a crook, a well-famous one. You don't want to deny that. What I don't want is very simple, Mr. Fegarty. I don't want to be a vice president of your bank. Oh? Oh, 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 I follow you now. <laughs> Don't worry, Lyon. Right. I promised you $20,000. That's right. For its equivalent in Hungarian bankers. Oh, wait a minute. And you'll get it without having to serve as an officer of this you bank. You promised me $20,000, old man. There weren't any gimmicks in the agreement about the joke money you folks pass off on each other locally. I know. I carry my own microscope for reading the fine type. Very well, very well. $20,000 it is. Uh, <clears throat> don't you want to know what I expect you to do for Mr. it? Mr. Feckerty, you keep making me repeat myself. I told you before that I'm a big boy now. If you're giving me 20,000 bucks, I can relax, not worry about asking you silly questions. You're going to get around eventually to telling me what you expect me to do for it. Hmm. Uh, did you ever hear of a bank giving a reward? Yes, but only after a bank robbery. Exactly. Uh. Exactly. Only after a bank has been robbed. I'm reversing the procedure line. I'm giving the reward first. Oh, so that's the little caper, is it? You want me to rob your bank for you? Well, not at all, not at all. A reward is usually given for apprehending the thieves who have robbed the bank. What I want you to do, Harry, uh, I may call you Harry? Maybe? Certainly, old man, call me Harry if it gives you any fun. Well, Harry, what I want you to do is to apprehend the robbers before the robbery is committed. <laughs> Very clever, don't you think so? Uh, have another cigar. <laughs> my business, I may get in the way of an awful lot of screwy deals, but I can tell you that never in a long career have I been offered in complete seriousness a loopier proposition than Mr. Feckett is. It seems the key to the whole affair was Mr. Feckett's junior officer in the bank, a certain Mr. Fodor. Lordis Loss Fodor is the full name, Harry. Mm. He's one of our vice presidents. I see. And I tell you this right now, the man is an unprincipled criminal. Oh? And come here and I'll show him to you. Come this way. You can see him through the glass pan. Oh, yes. There he is. Oh, that one? Second desk to the right. Uh, with all those silly hairs pasted over his bald head. <laughs> That's the man. He doesn't look very dangerous to me. Fodor? Dangerous? He is the brain of a backward bird and the charm of a worm. Now that I look back on it, I can't imagine how I ever persuaded myself to be jealous of Jealous? I don't follow you, old man. If I have a fault, Harry, it is this. I do tend to be jealous. Lulu often chides me about it, and I have promised to curb the instinct, but there... It is a part of my case. Lulu, you mean the girl in the flower shop across the way, that Lulu? She is the only Lulu I know, Mr. Lyon. How does it happen that you are acquainted with her? You see this carnation? I see it, yes. Lulu sold it to me, overcharged me, scandalously, as a matter of fact. Poor Lulu is a working girl, she must live. How does it happen you know her? What makes you think I do? You know her name? Oh, one of the other customers called her that while I was still in the shop. As it happens, it was this little fellow you just pointed out to me over there, the vice president, uh, Fodor. Third vice president. I hate to keep harping on these commercial matters, faculty old man, but just how does my $20,000 reward come into the picture? Uh, let us retire to my inner office, Harry, and I will tell you. Okay, come. old man. Uh, sit down, please, Harry. Have another cigar. My pockets are bulging with cigars now, old man. Let's concentrate on the 20000 Certainly, man. certainly. Oh, Miss Carver, Miss Carver. Yes, Mr. Feckety? Uh, no matter who calls, don't disturb me, not on any account. I'm having an important conference. Yes, Mr. Feckety. Oh, jealousy, Harry. Jealousy is a terrible yes, thing. Yes, yes, certainly is. Now about this reward. Uh... Jealousy is the green-eyed monster who doth mock the meat it feeds on. That's how the poet Shakespeare expresses yeah, the it. The poet Harry. Shakespeare said a mouthful, and now... But still, if it had not been for jealousy, I would never have followed this photo into Lulu's shop. And if I hadn't done that, I would never have discovered the digging. Digging? What digging? What would you say, Harry, if I were to tell you that running under the street from Lulu's flower shop to this bank, there is a tunnel? A tunnel? What would you say if I told you that? Well, eh? I'd say, well, 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 what do you know? That's what I'd say. That's what I said when I found out about it. And that's why I say now that I mustn't ever forget to be grateful to jealousy, particularly since I've discovered that there's nothing between Lulu and Fodor. Uh, nothing serious, please. And uh, do you know what I'd say to that? No. A couple of rude words. Yeah, but why? Why? You find him scrabbling away together like a couple of chubby moles, digging away in the general direction of your bank vault, and you say there's nothing serious between them? Tell you, sir, I'm sure of that. I have a Lulu's wife. And besides, what could she possibly see in a fat little identity like Fodor? 
No, the only one who thinks it's serious is Fodor. And that's the whole point. Fodor is a dupe, a mere cat's point in the conspiracy. Oh, yes, and who's the mastermind? I am. Uh huh. And what does Fodor think about that? He languishes in ignorance. He knows nothing. And to think that he aspires, he dares to aspire to my position in the bank. How does Lulu fit in? I must tell you that Lulu has given me some reason to hope that she will someday make me the happiest man in the world. And how would she do that? By giving up photo or sending you a big bouquet of roses? Let's get down to cases, old man. Wedding bells can ring out from Buddha to past and back again, but I won't be there to throw any rice unless I get paid. What is it exactly you want from me? Lessons on how to help Fodor and Lulu rob your bank? Fodor's going to do the robbing. And besides, it isn't my bank. I'm only a salary officer. And then Fodor gives you the money to give to Lulu. Is Certainly that not. It? Certainly not. That would be silly. Uh, that's just what I was thinking. No, no. Every day, Fodor is supposed to take the paper money from the various cages and place it in the vault. Yeah. This is his responsibility. Yeah. Tonight, however, he will not do this. He will leave the money outside the vault, hidden in a large filing cabinet. Oh, yeah. oh, the entire plan has been carefully worked out, I can assure you. All I can say is this folder of yours is a very cooperative type of cat's boy. Don't yeah. call him this folder of yours. He isn't. He's no folder of mine. Have it your own way, old man. What comes next? You, I suppose. Huh? You come a half hour later with a dark lantern and a gunny sack. You wrap up the money, join Lulu, who's been waiting for you across the street in the flower shop, and the two of you, hand in hand, move off down the road into the sunrise and also into the very choicest Hungarian who's come. What is a who's a jail or prison, a place of forcible incarceration, a lockup for bad little bank robbers. Not at all, not at all. It is Fodor who goes to prison. Oh, yes, and how do you work that? That is one of the things I want you to arrange. Oh, I see. I'm going to have to earn that 20000 I think we'll start by having it deposited in my name and in somebody else's bank, old man. Why now? And why another bank? Well, every bank in Budapest isn't going to be robbed tonight, so I think I'd prefer one of the others. And I'll take it now because I know you wouldn't want me to go to the police with what is, after all, a fairly sordid little Go to the police, but that's blackmail. Oh, watch your language, old man. Blackmail's a nasty word. You know, all I want is protection for my poor little 20000 I'll give you service for it, too, but I want to be absolutely positive that you're ready to meet your payroll. Very well. You'll have your money, but you will help me. I'm going to need a few more solid facts, old man. Well, it all began with this insane jealousy of mine for four Oh, yeah? I took to following him. He used to go into Lulu's flower shop at night long after it was closed. And one time he left the shutter unfastened and I went in. There were no lights in the shop itself, but I could hear voices from the basement below. I opened the trap door very carefully so as not to be heard. And what do you think I saw? You saw Lulu, Fodor, and three men all hard at work digging a tunnel. Hmm? Yeah. How did you know? I didn't, I guess. After all, you told me there was a tunnel. But the three men, how did you know about them? Uh, still guessing. It's pretty obvious that Mr. Fodor and Lulu couldn't dig much of a hole without getting some help. Tell me this. It was Lulu who persuaded you to call me in on this deal, wasn't it? How did you know that? Still just guessing, old man, just guessing. Now, let me guess on for a minute and stop me when I'm wrong. When you saw what Lulu and Fodor were doing, you went home and brooded for a while, and a few days afterwards, you confronted her. It was the next day. Okay, it was the next day. And Lulu admitted she was planning to rob the bank, but said she was just using Fodor, and you were the only one she really cared about. And if you joined the party, it's you she'd run off with, leaving Mr. Fodor holding the bag. Uh, an empty bag. How am I doing? <laughs> you are a clever man. Sure I am. That's why Lulu had you sent for me. You see, the idea is that Fodor will hide the money outside the vault and leave. Then, according to the arrangement, as he understands it, Lulu will come through the tunnel at night with her helpers and take the money back under the street through the tunnel. Uh, who did she tell Fodor these helpers were? She said one of them is her brother and the other two are cousins. And what did she tell you? That's what she told me. Uh, why? Nothing, nothing, old man. I need all Just give me one more guess, hmm? Oh, go ahead. After Fodor leaves the money, what you do is crawl back through the tunnel with a sack of currency clenched in your teeth. But no, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? You'd run into a couple of brothers crawling in the opposite direction. Uh, I, I'm not to have anything to do with the tunnel. Oh. You see, Fodor leaves the money out just before closing time. That way, he's implicated and we have a scapegoat. So there's nothing to stop me from letting myself in with my key at night and walking away with the money. Who could suspect me? It's a perfect crime, Harry. Would you say so? Yes, yes, it's quite a crime if you look at it in one way. Uh, but tell me about the brothers. What are they supposed to think about all this? Oh, they don't know about it. Lulu hasn't told them. But the news will reach them eventually. And what then? They must be implicated somehow, along with Fodor. But I must be protected. I'm Lulu. That's what you're here for, Harry. Have another cigar. Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man.
And now, Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with today's story, Too Many Crooks. Naturally, the first thing I did after making my farewells to Mr. Feckety was to go across the street and pay a call on Lulu. Harry, yeah. listen to me carefully. I'm listening, honey. There's a little cafe on the hill above the old city. You know the place? Mm -hmm. There's a gold roost on the roof. Well, what about it? Go there and wait for me. You never can tell when Fodor Feckety will be bursting in here. They keep jumping across the street to check up on each other and buying geraniums. <laughs> go to the cafe and I'll be with you as soon as I can close well, up what, here. What about the boys below? Oh, what do you mean? The construction crew, the Corellis. Oh, um, Feckety told you about the Corellis? I would have found out anyway, Lily. Lulu. Okay, what happens to them if you shut up the store? Isn't there a way out? No, but they won't be finished work before I'm back. And besides, what they don't know won't hurt them. Lily, or rather Lulu, it looks to me as though just about everybody around here is due to be hurt by what they don't know. I found the gold rooster and sat down on the terrace of the restaurant to wait for Mr. Feckety's fiancée. Over a glass of tokai, I tried to add up the situation as of then. As far as I could see, the whole setup was like a Picasso painting. No matter how you looked at it, it was cockeyed and upside down. Hello, Harry. Don't order anything for right. me. I haven't time. Don't worry, Lily. I'm not here to celebrate. We can have our party after. I know who's going to pay the check. I wish you'd call me Lulu. Okay, Lulu. Now, here's all the sense I can make out of this little caper. You came here with the Corelli no, gang, right? No, they came first. Oh. Then they sent for me to work in the flower shop for a front. The tunnel was their idea. Then you sent for me. That was your You're idea. You're right. Mm -hmm. My photo thinks he's going to divvy up with the Corellis and marry you on the mm, proceeds. Something like that. And Feckety thinks something like the same something. The president thinks he's going to put it over the vice president. What about the construction crew? You mean Walter and yes, the others? Yes, the the original burglars. What are they going to get out of this? According to Feckety, it's going to be the old double cross, but if I know you, Feckety's in for the same gentle treatment. Harry, why should anybody get anything out of this except... Okay, Larry, okay. Book a couple of spaces for us on the first milk train out of Budapest, but be sure to get reservations on the bulletproof car. I wish you'd call me Lulu. <laughs> A lot of trusting Hungarian depositors line up at the bank, leave their hard-earned pengos at the impressive-looking gilt cages for what they fondly believe is safekeeping, and hurry home to have their evening plate of goulash. Closing time comes and goes. Feckety doesn't leave. He just pretends to and stays skulking in his office. Meanwhile, Fodor takes the big packages of pengos, which, as you know, is Hungarian for money, dutifully to the door of the vault. He slams the vault loudly, this being for the benefit of the janitor, who is deaf anyway and doesn't hear, and quickly stows the loot in the empty filing cabinet which he has thoughtfully left nearby for just this purpose. He then goes home and passes a very restless night. The moon rises over the city and winks at its own reflection in the Danube. A lot of good Hungarians are in their beds. The others are all in a nightclub called the Arizona, dancing the Shardash. They do not come into this story, so we'll leave them dancing. Down onto the street, the Corellis, those adept bank robbers, continue to dig. They are putting the finishing touches on their tunnel, and we will not listen in on them because their conversation is very vulgar indeed. <laughs> In his luxurious office, Mr. Feckety sits biting his nails and dreaming of a long West Indian cruise with Lulu in an adjoining deck chair. As the gang in the tunnel understand it, when the clock strikes 12, they are to open the secret trap door which they have previously prepared inside the bank a section of tiling near the vault, go to the filing cabinet and take out the money which Porter has left there, thus eliminating the noise and inconvenience of breaking into the vault and, first closing the loose tile after themselves, scuttle back with the loot under the street into the flower shop, out into the night and as far away from Hungary as possible. As I say, that's the way the gang in the tunnel understand it. This is also the arrangement as Mr. Fodor understands it with a trifling difference that he expects Lulu to stop by for him with his share of the profits. Like Mr. Feckety, he is biting his nails and dreaming of tropical cruises. And what of Lulu? Uh -huh, what of Lulu indeed? It is Lulu's little plan to foozle everybody, Corelli, Fodor, and Feckety. She's led them all on to just this point. It is the point of departure. 
Lulu's departure. Lulu and all those neatly wrapped packages of Pengos. The trouble is, it's all just a little bit too much for one little girl to handle alone, so Harry Lyme's been sent for. Harry is supposed to assist at the general foozling of one and all, and then, in due time, of course, he's to be foozled as well. Lulu will send Harry off to mail a postcard, and when he gets back, Lulu will have continued her travels alone, with nothing to keep her company but the loot. That, as I say, is the way Lulu understands it. The clock, high in the steeple of San Stefano, strikes twelve. This is the signal. Mr. Corelli, that celebrated expert with his two able assistants, starts toward the bank. The tunnel was not built for comfort, and the going on hands and feet is a trifle rough. There's a bit of genteel cursing, but hearts are high. At the sound of the clock, Mr. Feckety removes the bound bundles of money from their place of safety and checks once again the bolts and fastenings which keep the loose tile in its place. In the darkness, Mr. Feckety smiles. He is satisfied that, contrary to the Corelli's expectations, the bank end of the tunnel is firmly and irrevocably closed. Still smiling, he starts toting the money toward the side door for which he, Mr. Feckety, is the perfectly legal possessor of a key. On the outside, Lulu, with a high-speed car, is supposed to be waiting for him. Unfortunately, however, a moment earlier, Harry Lyme, on the flower shop end of the tunnel, has persuaded Lulu to go down for a moment and tell the boys not to try lifting that trick tile for at least a half hour. Lulu hates herself now for not having analyzed the merits of this suggestion. She has plenty of time now to think this over because foxy old Harry in the flower shop has bolted down the trap door. The clock has stopped striking, of course, and Mr. Feckety pops out of his bank looking for all the world like a jolly Christmas shopper with his arms loaded with bundles. There is a high-speed car waiting for Mr. Feckety, all right, but it is full of strange gentlemen, and they are all dressed in uniforms. Put up your hands, Feckety. Yeah. Put up your hands. You're under arrest. But, but there's some mistake. Oh, not at all, old man. No mistake at all. You see, gentlemen, just as you were told, there he is, and there's the money. Come along now, Feckety. We are taking you in. You, Harry, a police informer. Not a bit of it, old man. I wouldn't dream of telling on you. No, the cops got the tip off from an anonymous letter, and you know how you spell anonymous? L-U-L-U. Lulu. She did it. Lulu. Lulu. That wouldn't be Lulu Hartz, would it? Uh, alias Lily the Twister. Yes, officer, I believe so. There's a reward offered for her capture, isn't there? Huh? I should say there is. What about the Corelli gang? They've got the biggest price on their heads in Central Europe. Oh, that's lovely. It's all beginning to add up when you throw in the generous reward Mr. Feckety posted in the name of his bank this afternoon. Uh, but you're not going to collect that, are oh, you? Why not, old man? After all, you put up the money for me to collect before the bank was robbed, didn't you? You also wanted me to thwart the Corellis, and if you yourself are foolish enough to go breaking the law, you'll just have to oh. tell it to the judge. I have Tell him plenty. I'll tell him about you. Go ahead. I haven't broken any laws, remember, and you'll only help me collect my various rewards. As a matter of fact, Lyme, just what is your connection with this affair? What have you done? Officer, all I did was turn a bolt on a trap door. Nothing at all, really. Just a twist of the wrist. And now, if you've got some spare handcuffs ready, I think we'd better open it up again. The folks down below may be getting a little fretful, and I think they'll appreciate a change of scene. If you'll come with me, officer, I'll show you the place. Really, Mr. Lyme, I can't tell you how great Please, will... please, old man, don't mention it. Pleasure, I assure you. Won't you have a cigar? Harry Lyme returns in just a moment. I had thought of substituting those fat packages of pengos for the same weight of old newspapers. But the rate of exchange wasn't so good on the pengo just then, so I resisted the temptation. After all, as Mother always said, 
too many crooks spoil the goulash.